So this is my Panasonic S52X. I have had it for about six months now. And if you're after a short review of it, uh, this isn't going to be it. But the summary would be, I love this camera, particularly for video. It is a great hybrid camera. It's not perfect at everything, but I love using it. And keep that in mind when I'm criticizing it in this video, because that's what I think is important to do. I think you should know about the flaws for these things, even if the person talking about it loves it. I bought this with my own money. I don't have any contact with Panasonic and I really, really like using this camera for many different things. In fact, filming myself with the Nikon Z9 right now is infuriating compared to filming myself with this. It's just an easy device to use. And this video is proving quite frustrating to make so far. But let's get into it. I even have a list this time because it's quite hard to memorize everything about this camera because it does so much. And yet there are a few sort of odd problems with it. When I initially tested it in early, I don't even think it was spring, I think it was winter last year, I found a bug in it that prevented me at the time using it or purchasing it to be a photography camera, to be my wildlife camera. And I still, stand by that. I don't think this makes a brilliant wildlife camera. It will take good wildlife photos, but it's problematic in some aspects for that. It's problematic in some other photography aspects too. I find it a little bit difficult in certain situations, but it shows a lot of promise from Panasonic for future photography targeted models as well. And overall, it's still a very usable camera and I use this as my sort of travel camera as well because it is a very capable, very portable photo and video camera. So I'm going to start by talking about the controls on this camera and the controls on it are largely very good. I like the control layout. I think it's quite reminiscent, especially on the top of sort of older film SLRs with the sort of twin dial setup. I like the uh, the function buttons here. I like the location of the recording button. I love the location of the on off switch. I must admit, I find that very easy to operate with my thumb because I have fairly large hands and I can flick it on and off with my thumb or my finger. I like it. I love the sort of wheel on the back. This one, it's, a, it's also a four way joy pad. I have always liked the little single continuous manual focus switch here. It is a really nice control layout, mostly. There are a couple of flaws on it. I don't like the play button being over here. That's probably something that comes more from wildlife photography for me. When you're using a longer lens, taking your hand off of the long lens and taking that weight entirely on the lens mount to be able to press the play button to review images is quite annoying. I would prefer it to be somewhere over here. That's something that Nikon do on their control layout that I really like. And um, it bumps into a problem with the touchscreen in particular when you're trying to hit this. I hit the touchscreen all the time and I found it so frustrating that I've actually disabled the touchscreen on this camera because I have to press that so often and it was always changing my focus points, things like that. So that's something to keep in mind. That's probably more of a me problem. And when you're using a shorter lens, and if you're shooting it more like a, a photo camera, sort of like a film camera almost, then the control layout makes a lot of sense. It's up there, you know, you can hit it very easily. It's nowhere near as problematic as I'm making it sound, but it's a thing that winds me up and I guess it's worth noting. Something they updated on the body for this camera that I really like is it has proper strap brackets. Take note, other camera makers like Nikon, stop putting those stupid wiggly triangular pin brackets on your cameras, especially if they're supposed to do video as well. Panasonic listened to all of their customers saying that the old design was irritating. They've put these on, love it. It's a great upgrade to the camera. It's a little bit odd that they're sort of pointing in different directions, but it really doesn't make any difference whatsoever. 
I really, really appreciate that change. Something that is lacking in the controls of this camera, however, are locks. It's really annoying that none of the dials can be locked. The diopter adjustment cannot be locked. This dial, which everyone has complained about online, cannot be locked. Well, it can be. You can operation lock it, and I'll go into that in a bit. But that is very easily hit. If you're wearing thicker gloves, all of these are easily hit by mistake. And that is frustrating. It would be nice to have push button locks on them. I think it's a worthwhile upgrade to any future version of this or other Panasonic cameras. I think they should put locking wheels on all of those. I would love to see a lock or some sort of cover for the diopter adjustment wheel because I keep hitting this on clothing when it's like thicker clothing, especially if I'm carrying the camera on a strap. That is irritating and that's the thing that doesn't need to happen. It could be behind a little door, it could be like the Nikon one which you sort of pull out and adjust and then push back. There is an improvement to be made there to the design of it. So two other very, very sort of picky foibles with this camera. Uh, number one is when I got it, I thought there was something wrong with the rubber grips on it. They felt very, very sticky. They continue to feel sticky to me. And I don't know if this is me, but I don't get this on other cameras. It, it just has a tacky sort of feeling and it feels like it's made my hands a little bit tacky afterwards. This might be me. I have been known to corrode the aluminium on MacBooks in the past. That was a new one to the Apple techs. So it could be me. I don't think it's something critical and I don't even notice it anymore. It's just um, something I noticed when I got it out of the box and I thought it was a little bit strange as it's not something I'd experienced before. One thing that I find kind of frustrating on this camera is it has plenty of buttons that you can reassign, but I wish it had an additional function button on the front. They use this same camera body for the Panasonic G9 II because they move the mount switch over to here because it's a micro four thirds mount and the, the switch for detaching lenses is over here. They could fit a second function button in here. I would have liked that. I mean, even if they'd just put it sort of there in that little gap, it, it would have been a little bit fiddly, but it would have been quite nice to have. You can rebind all of these buttons, but I like their default functionality. So yeah, it's a bit of a uh, an odd request, but an additional single function button would be nice, particularly because, as I said about the dials, uh, this dial is very easy to hit by mistake. And so in video mode in particular, I have the front function button set to operation lock. Operation lock completely locks the controls, so you can't accidentally hit that and change your shutter angle. And that's really nice, but then that means I don't have another function button on the front to do other things that I like to do in video, like maybe turn off uh, the live LUT preview or something like that. And my last complaint about the camera is something that I suspect only really affects me. I find that the memory card door on this, it, it hasn't opened in my hand, but it feels like it's going to. I can feel it sort of flexing under the hand. That's kind of unfortunate. But the counter to that is that I've seen a lot of people complain about the Nikon Z9's card door for some reason, saying that it's quite hard to open because it's got a switch built into it. And I like that setup. I like that switch. I like how secure it feels on the Z9. So I suspect this is just personal preference. I've not seen anyone else mentioning this, that it's too easy to open. So I think that's just a me thing. Now, when it comes to the flaps on the other side, this is something that Sony does much better than Panasonic. On the S52X, these are just rubber flaps. And you can see that they kind of flap yeah, they just flap about a lot. And when you have a microphone and you plug it into the microphone port there and you walk around, this little door will hit on your microphone plug on the 3.5 millimeter jack and it will pick it up because it's sending a rumble through to the microphone. That is quite annoying. 
Uh, I don't pop the door off. I use like a hairband, although, you know, as I seem to be low on them at the moment, uh, to sort of hold it out of the way because that's quite irritating. On the Sony cameras, the doors just sort of pop open and they stay open. That is a much nicer design. I would like to see that on future Panasonic cameras as well. Now my very last physical thing, I think, I didn't write this in order, so it's uh, proving quite challenging for me to actually remember where everything goes. The last thing I would note is if you owned a previous Panasonic camera, that the viewfinder on this is much deeper, it's much longer. This is because it holds the fan. Now you can probably see this uh, if I get the Z9 to focus, there we go. So there is a fan intake under here and two exhausts on the side. That has extended the viewfinder unit. It sticks out quite a bit from the back of the camera. It makes it a little bit more awkward to fit it into bags, particularly because the uh, rubber sort of viewfinder element on the S5 2X is actually secured on with screws. I like that because as anyone who's owned a Canon camera in the past will know, those things go missing all the time. I do like that, but because it sticks out quite a bit from the camera, it does make it a little bit more awkward to fit in certain bags. Not a problem though, just something to note. So let's go back to some positives of this camera for a little bit, because otherwise I just end up sounding extremely negative. I love using this camera for video. It is so, so easy compared to any other camera that I've operated. Default settings just work. It's got an extremely comprehensive array of different recording settings and codec support, and I'll come to that in a minute. It is so easy to film yourself with it and get good video straight out of the camera. Uh, I love grading it. I tend to shoot in vlog. I stick it into DaVinci Resolve. I stick a LUT on it. It's basically done. It's ridiculously easy to, uh, to work with. It's got some extremely nice features for video that are missing on other cameras. Like uh, you can choose to set your own custom white balance and you just press the white balance button and pick one of the custom slots, point it at something that is white, press the set button. It takes a photo. The white balance is now set. Brilliant. It's so convenient to use. If you're into your video, you'll just love using this camera. It's so very, very easy. It uses shutter angle, so you can set it to 180 and then just forget about it. It's really, really nice. One of the key selling points of the Panasonic system for quite a long time has been their image stabilization. And in this camera, it is brilliant. I did find it less of a step forward than perhaps people were sort of hinting at in the original announcement videos of this. And I found if you really want super smooth image stabilization on this camera, you want to pair it with an optically stabilized lens. The quality of the image stabilization when it's paired with this 24 to 105 with an image stabilizer is phenomenal. It's slightly warpier when you use an unstabilized lens. So if you're using the 20 to 60, which is my preferred sort of uh, general vlogging lens, I have the 14 to 28 as well. As you go below 20 millimeters, you start to get some warping in the corners in the image stabilization. That's very, very hard for anyone to deal with because of the way that perspective angles and stuff work in that case. And the sensor would need to move extremely far in order to accommodate for that. I do generally shoot with the uh, digital stabilization turned on as well. It works really well. And uh, I like shooting with this camera. It's great for handheld shots of myself and it's great for other things. Now, when it comes to photos, it's also really, really good. And I like taking slow handheld shots on this camera. It's much better than the Nikon Z9 in my experience for that sort of shot. And I find it very easy to use, but I am also typically using it with an image stabilized lens in order to do that. And you can get nice slow shutter speeds handheld on this camera. But it is kind of weird. I think the image stabilization is better for video than it is for photos. I think other cameras are 
perhaps even better than this camera for photo image stabilization. But for video, it's just very natural looking, it's very smooth, and that is very different to technically being the best, if that makes sense. It looks the most natural, the least jarring when it's stabilizing things. It's very, very impressive. The G9 II is apparently even better. I haven't tested one myself yet. I would be quite interested to see that. So when it comes to video options on this camera, it's just so nice to have a camera that gives you a huge array of codec support for different formats. So I like shooting in 422 10-bit. I like to shoot this way because I tend to do a lot of things quite early in the morning or have done historically. I like smooth gradients in the sky, all those sorts of things. And I just really like the video quality in that setting. But on many cameras at the moment, in order to record in that setting, you typically have to record the file as H.265. And this is a problem. So if you use a Mac, and I have talked about this in the past, but if you use a Mac, you're fine. There's no problem with those formats. But if you use a Windows computer to do your video editing, it can be really difficult because NVIDIA and AMD do not include hardware decoders on their graphics cards for H.265, 422, 10-bit. Intel do. So if you have an Intel CPU or one of the new Intel Arc graphics cards, you're fine. You don't need to worry about it. But this was a problem for me when I had the Fujifilm X-H2S. It would only record in that format in H.265, and it caused me a lot of problems for editing. On this camera, if you shoot in 4K, 422, 10-bit, you can record in H.264, which is widely supported everywhere. And yes, the files aren't quite as, uh, quite as compact, but it doesn't matter. It records it to SD cards. It'll record it to V60 SD cards as well. You don't even need V90 cards. It can be edited on any computer. It's awesome. It's so easy to work with those files. Now, if you want to go to a higher resolution, you do have to change how you're recording. Some of them can still be recorded to H.264 files, but you do start to need uh, V90 cards just due to the high bitrate that is involved with shooting at those sort of resolutions like the 6K mode or 5 point whatever K it is. So I don't tend to shoot in the 6K mode very much because and this is the downside to this camera, it still only supports SD cards. Now, SD cards are plentiful and cheap, we all have tons of SD cards, but how many V90 cards do you have? Because V90 cards are basically the same price for the amount of storage that you get as CF Express Type B cards, only they're still significantly slower. So I'd like to see camera makers moving towards sort of combo slots like Sony do, where you have the option of either CF Express, in their case, Type A or SD cards, or having one slot of each type. The reason being that when it comes to higher speed things, CF Express Type B cards are better value for money than V90 SD cards. They are not dissimilar in price, but significantly faster. So it feels like a bit of a I don't know, a bit of a fallacy that the companies stick to SD cards for their cost savings. It's sort of prohibiting them from doing some other formats like higher speed video formats, and particularly for higher speed burst photography. This camera is not the best at burst photography. It isn't super fast clearing its buffer because at the end of the day, it's only going to SD cards. While we're on the subject of video, there's a feature that everyone made quite a big deal of when it was announced, and I thought it would be just pointless. And that is the real-time LUT feature, where you can bake a LUT into your video footage. And I don't really see the point. The log footage from the camera is so easy to grade. I already use DaVinci Resolve, which is kind of made for color grading. It takes me maybe 15 seconds to do it in post, so I didn't, I, I didn't really see the point of this feature. What a lot of people seem to miss is that it applies in photo mode too. So you can put LUTs on this camera as custom picture profiles and you can use them 
to take JPEG photos with a Latapied. That's awesome, it's a really unique feature and I really quite like that feature. I don't use it a huge amount, but it's nice to have it. I think it's an interesting way of doing custom picture profiles. A lot of other cameras, so uh, Fujifilm for example, uh, has the Fuji X Weekly app where it details how to set up different uh, sort of film simulations, all those sorts of things. Really nice app, really nice film simulations in the Fuji cameras, and they are still better than this in that regard. But for this, you can just supply a LUT file and someone can just put it in and start taking photos with it. It's a nice setup and it's a feature that wasn't really talked about a huge amount. Everyone kind of focused on the video and to be honest, I don't really see the point of that feature for video, but for photos, kind of cool, nice feature to have. Something I really, really like on this camera is the monochrome profiles for photography. I like to take good in-camera JPEGs. It doesn't mean I necessarily use them all the time, but it's nice to have. It's nice to have a, an accurate image as to how something could look. And the monochrome profiles from this, the L dot monochrome, and then there's two extra ones. There's an L dot monochrome D and an S copy as well. They're slightly different contrasts, slightly different ranges of grays, that sort of thing. Uh, awesome. It's a really, really nice and quite uh, filmic look to the photos. It, in its default state, it seems to be quite close to how Ilford HP5 comes out. I think it's a really, really interesting profile. And I like shooting black and white on this camera. It is just quite a nice experience, especially because you've got a uh, an EVF. You can see what it looks like. And I shoot quite a lot of black and white on this. It's almost a really good street camera. And I'll explain why it's a little bit frustrating shortly. But I do really, really like the, uh, the built-in picture profiles. And I like the default colors of the Panasonic cameras. I liked the S5 a lot. I took it with me to Switzerland and did some landscape photos on it. And I just loved how they came out by default. They just looked vibrant, but not excessively so. The balance is brilliant. There's a sort of a softness to the colors. They're really, really nice. And they're nice by default, and that's quite rare in cameras these days. I prefer the colors in this to the colors in Nikon. Brilliant default sort of setup in a camera. It's one of the nice things about the Panasonic is out of the box, it's taking nice photos, it's doing nice video stuff. It's a really good out of the box camera. You don't have to change a huge amount to get this performing brilliantly. It's a very easy camera to get started on. And I really recommend it for people sort of starting out as well. I think it's a good beginner's camera because it's not very complicated to operate and that's quite a nice thing to have, really. So one last video specific foible on this camera is that the microphone preamps on it are noisy, or at least they're not. This is where it gets a little bit weird. So if you're using a on-camera microphone of some description, and uh, so this is a Sennheiser uh, MKE 400, it's not bad. Uh, I did try to do a review of it at one point, but I got kind of bored. And you plug it in to your microphone port like this. Great, it's got good on-camera audio settings, but there's a problem, and that is that there is an electrical noise that you pick up for any microphone used in this way. I think it is specific to certain video settings. This is where it gets really weird because it doesn't appear to be in all of them. And I think it's effectively a feedback loop of some description or electrical interference more specifically from the processor on this camera, somehow interfering with this port. This is not uncommon on electronics. Uh, a good historical example is the Game Boy. The Game Boy Color in particular, I modified my old one a while back and um, I did some wires to skip some internal circuitry because they caused this sort of problem with its uh, speaker setup and particularly its headphone port. And you could 
resolder a couple of wires and skip a part of the electrical circuitry which picked up electrical noise from elsewhere on the Game Boy. And unfortunately, it's a problem that's reared its head again on this camera. And you get this sort of high-pitched uh, cricket sort of noise. And I'm going to try and uh, put a quick clip of it in now, just so that you know what this sounds like. This test was recorded in the 6K open gate mode, and it seems to vary when I get this noise, but that mode definitely seems to uh, bring it out more often. Something that I did notice whilst recording this test, however, is that I can physically hear this noise coming from the camera. I have very sensitive hearing. I'm not sure if everyone will be able to hear this. I can hear the electrical noise of power transformers, for example. So on most electronic devices, I can hear their power adapters. And that's obviously quite irritating, but I can hear it from the S52X as well. I have to put my head very close to the left-hand side of the camera, right around the audio jack, and I can hear this high-pitched cricket noise. I'm assuming it's being picked up by the jack itself. I don't know for certain, but it definitely exists, and I can certainly hear it in real life too. Now, is this a problem? Not really. Uh, if you're doing audio for video, you're probably going to use some sort of noise reduction software, or at least you probably should be using some sort of noise reduction software in order to reduce that sort of noise on your recordings. I use, uh, what do I use? I use Isotope RX and it works very, very well. I use the, uh, the voice denoise I just leave it set to automatic and it removes that noise entirely. So it's not a problem, but if you do want to resolve this for yourself, and this is less useful if you're filming yourself because you kind of want a little on-camera shotgun like this or a wireless microphone or something, something compact. If you don't want something compact, like if you're just me in my office, for example, then you can use this, which is the XLR adapter. And I picked this up second hand, which is a good bargain. Uh, but it is an XLR adapter. Got an XLR port there. I'm currently using the microphone I typically use with this, so I'm not going to connect it up. This skips that problem entirely. This draws power from the camera, which is awesome. Really like this. I attach my microphone to the top of this. It ends up taller than it is wide, which is unfortunate. But if I really, really want to get straightforward, perfect sounding audio in camera, this is awesome and it feeds the audio directly through the hot shoe interface. You do not have to go through that mic port at all. It works really well. It's not ideal having to do this. I would have liked to see some better isolation on that mic preamp, but it's not the end of the world and it's something that's quite easily solved. So I really wouldn't worry too much about it. One very tiny quibble with this camera is that if you have had it turned off for a long time and you turn it on, it has a delayed startup time. Now, I believe that this was a fix that Panasonic put in a few years back in some of their other cameras where they found that they had quite a strong phantom power drain over time on their batteries. And uh, I believe the reasoning for this underneath in terms of how it works is that you kind of have these switches be actual on off switches because people could turn off the power in the middle of writing photos and it could corrupt the card that sort of thing so this is sort of a switch that the state is just checked in term in the software there's something that's monitoring the switch and i believe what they've done is extended the interval by which it checks the state of that switch after the camera has been off for a long time. So it's a quick demo. I've turned this on pretty recently and you can see that if I turn the switch on, it's effectively immediate. Very, very nice. But if you haven't used it in a day, you turn the switch on, it takes about sort of five seconds to spin up. Not something that bothers me, it really doesn't matter. But if you do get one of these and you wonder why that's happening, that's my understanding of the problem and it's not really a problem. Just turn your camera on once before you're planning on going taking photos somewhere. Um, it seems to eff effectively be fine most of the day. So again, just another thing to note. 
Now for this last section of the video, I'm just going to talk about the remaining photo things that are on my list. And there are some good photo features on this camera. It is a nice photography camera. I love it for travel photography. I liked the S5 for travel photography. I didn't love its autofocus, but it was a really good travel camera. And the same is true of this. I think it's a good sort of general use camera if I was taking photos of family events, you know, those sorts of things. This would be a brilliant camera and I think it would be for the vast majority of people. Where it falls down a little bit is that its action photography specs are not the best. Being the first camera with phase detect autofocus from Panasonic, it's got a few sort of odd little problems, not that many. And to be fair, for their first attempt at doing phase detect autofocus, it's very, very impressive. It performs very well, it's very accurate too. I do find if there are multiple subjects in the frame that it can be very uh, distracted, I suppose. It's constantly picking up different subjects. It's very hard to pick the one that you want. That can be quite frustrating and uh, it's not the most intuitive uh, interface I've found for that. You can pick it using the um, the little joystick on the back. You can pick the subject that you want, but when it loses them, it then swaps to a different subject. It's it's not really perfect, and it's something that I think could be improved in future. But the autofocus in general on this camera is a massive improvement over previous Panasonic cameras. It's very hard to describe just how much better it is than the Panasonic S5. It's a huge step up. It, even if it's not perfect, the S5 was infuriating. For video in particular, but for certain photo situations like low light photography, this is a better camera. But that's only if you're in continuous autofocus mode. So you need to have your selector here set to C in order for it to focus in low light, because if it's set to S, to single shot autofocus, it only uses contrast detect. Now, this feels almost like a pride thing from Panasonic because they spent so many years talking about their contrast detect system and it basically being better. But it's very, very easy to reproduce a problem with this and to get very authentic S5 Mark I autofocus out of this camera. If you set it to single shot autofocus and you try and focus on something with poor contrast, it does not focus. It's <laughs> quite bizarre. In those situations, if you swap it to continuous AF, it takes over with phase detect autofocus and it will focus on those subjects much more readily. So it's a little bit of an odd thing. The general sort of gist is that the contrast detect autofocus is more accurate, but that's only when it works. So it, it's almost something where I'd like a menu option for this to be able to say, I would like to use phase detect in single shot as well. I don't see why it can't be a combination. It's a little bit annoying really, but again, not really a huge problem. So one more negative of this camera is that the sensor is slow. Now, Gerald Undone has some good tests showing the rolling shutter of this camera in video mode. Uh, I'll put a link to his video up here. Um, go and check that out because he has actual, you know, measurements of rolling shutter and things like that. Worth going and seeing. Rolling shutter is not just a problem for video. However, it is a problem for photos. Now, this camera does not have a very fast shutter rate. I think with continuous autofocus, you're only getting around five to six FPS mechanical shutter, which is uh, adequate for normal photography, for street photography or anything like that. That is fine. It's not really enough for wildlife, for my use cases, for birds in flight and things like that. I typically shoot up around sort of 15 to 20 for that. and. I'd like to see an improvement there in future cameras. Fujifilm have 15 FPS mechanical shutters. Those sorts of things exist. They could have also just improve it by having a faster reading sensor. They could do a stack sensor in a, say an S1 Mark II and be able to uh, offer those sorts of speeds without rolling shutter. Now, 
where rolling shutter is a bit of a problem on this camera is if you do want some faster shooting speeds, there is an electronic shutter mode. This was actually one of the reasons why I didn't originally buy this camera for wildlife last year. I found a bug in it where it wouldn't retake photos while it was still recording them the first time. The whole electronic shutter feature on this camera I don't find very useful. There's a delay to starting the capture. There's a de delay to sort of ending the capture. It feels very laggy. And because the sensor on this is slow, you get a lot of downsides to using that mode. So if you're doing action, you're going to get warping in photos because of how it's reading it out. You can get duplicate elements. So like if wings are moving fast on birds, it might have sort of ghost wings. Uh, the biggest problem I've found is if I'm trying to shoot this quietly, so say in, a, in an indoor sort of setting, like in the arcades in Cardiff for street photography, maybe I swap it to electronic shutter mode. The problem though is that because the sensor reads out very slowly, or comparatively slowly, you get a lot of banding from modern light fixtures. Now this could partly be due to the fact that the only electronic shutter speed on this camera is 30 fps. If this was 25 it might not be as problematic here in the UK. It might line up better with our electrical frequencies. But effectively when you shoot in electronic burst mode here in the UK you get a lot of banding from LED light fixtures. So you get dark lines, light lines, that sort of thing, because LEDs work by pulsing, the sensor is scanned top to bottom, and so you're picking up the alternate pulses as it scans through. You're getting about sort of five pulses per picture, something like that, two to five. It's kind of hard to count, but it's kind of frustrating and effectively I never use the electronic shutter mode in this. It's not fast enough to have an electronic burst mode in my opinion. So it's something I would like to see them improve on another camera. This clearly isn't the the sort of goal of this camera. This was very much designed to be a sort of a creative uh, or a creator's camera and it hits that sort of ambition admirably. It's very good at that. It is not a great action camera. That's not to say you can't use it for that, and I will probably do a video on that at some point in the near future, but it is something to note. The electronic burst mode, even though it's sort of touted as having it, I wouldn't really rely on it personally, and there are some downsides to using it. The mechanical speed of the burst mode is perfectly adequate for things like street photography, family events, all those sorts of things. And, you know, landscapes don't tend to move very fast, so you probably don't need it for those. One other thing to note if you're into sort of action shooting of some description is that the viewfinder in this has two speeds. It has 60 FPS and it has 120. If you set it to 120, the resolution drops. Quite notably so, I find it quite frustrating to shoot that way. So I have this set to 60, but because it's not a very action-oriented camera, in my opinion, I think that's fine. Uh, it's just something that would be a nice update in the future to uh, to have something like that. I would say I like the viewfinder on this camera though. I have no problems with it. I think it's bright enough. It's nice to use. And um, yeah, I, I like shooting through it. So I have no problems with it. Again, it's just a little sort of a quirk, I suppose, of the camera. Now, my last point is something that this is inherited from the first version and that this is the best low light mirrorless camera that I have used. It is a fantastic low light camera. It shoots up to ISO 51200. It doesn't fill the raw files full of noise reduction software. The noise is easy to fix later. It maintains its colors brilliantly when shooting at max ISO. It is probably just at that perfect midpoint of resolution and light sensitivity because it's a 24 megapixel camera but it's full frame so it really really hits a nice midpoint and compared to some other competing cameras uh, I believe the Canon R6 II has quite a lot of baked in noise reduction this doesn't do that you're just given the raw image and if you are somebody who shoots in low light being given full control over how you repair 
sort of high ISO photos, it's it's much better to have it as raw as possible. So no built-in noise reduction, just the default colors and all those sorts of things. And then software like Lightroom or Topaz or DxO Pure Raw, those sorts of things can do a better job of noise reducing the photos. And this is a brilliant low light camera. It really is. And I don't think Panasonic have made enough of this sort of feature. It's a fairly niche use case, I suppose, and not many people tend to shoot at that high an ISO on these sorts of cameras. I do shoot at very high ISO because I'm shooting wildlife in a country where we haven't seen the sun in two months. And in those instances, having good low light sensitivity and particularly good color support in low light is very, very nice. I really rate this camera for low light photography. Now, one last thing about this camera, but not really about this camera, is that I think this is a very appealing entrance to the L-mount system. Sigma and Panasonic have been bringing out the majority of the lenses for the L-mount system for quite a long time now. And finally, it feels like there's a camera that can take advantage of a lot of the features of those lenses. And it's a weird mount system because it's been around for quite a while now and there's quite a decent lens selection, better than quite a few other camera manufacturers who I won't name right now. But it's second, in my opinion, right now, only to the Sony E-mount system in terms of the availability of lenses. And there's some great weird lenses available for this system. The 20 to 60, which is a kit lens that you can get with this camera, uh, as a bundle with this, the 50 millimeter 1.8, that's a really good bundle. This is a great lens, particularly if you like filming yourself, this is a great lens as a walk around 50. Yes, it's a a bit big, but there are some reasons for that, and it's a really, really good lens. So that's a good kit to buy this camera as a part of. The 20 to 60 is a really interesting lens because it's perfect as a walk around lens if you're also wanting to film yourself, because 20 millimeters is perfect for holding a camera and doing that. These lenses second hand, you can buy very cheap. That's how I bought these. Uh, they are very reasonable. Both of them can be picked up under 200 pounds and I highly recommend those. But there are so many good lenses available on the L mount now. There are two different 70 to 200s just from Panasonic. They have a 2.8 and an F4. Sigma have a 2.8. Uh, there's this fantastic lens, the 24 to 105 F4. I love this lens. This is just a beautiful lens to use for video and general photography. If I'm doing landscapes and stuff, I'll just take this. It is a corking lens, and that is true of so many of the lenses available on the L-mount system. So that's something very appealing to me about this camera, is that I like the lenses available for it. And both Sigma and Panasonic, I think, have done a very good job of fleshing out their lineup for it. So it's a perk to this camera to have access to, quite frankly, a very good lens selection now. And that's pretty much it for my review of the S5 IIX. I love this camera, and it does something that is quite rare with modern cameras, for me at least, in that I still feel connected to the shooting experience with this camera. I found this with the Fujifilm X-H2S as well. I like the shooting experience. It feels like I'm taking photos, if that makes sense. If I have to take a camera out with me, I mean, have to. If I'm going out for a day out, I'm going out just to wander around somewhere, I take this. I don't take the Nikon Z9. The Z9 is a significantly better camera. It's a significantly more expensive camera, but it also feels more detached from the shooting process. Maybe that's because this is slightly more frustrating for things like action photography. It's a less capable camera. And yet I feel a sense of connection when I'm using this camera. And it's not perfect. It doesn't work for every use case, but then no camera does. I can't vlog with the Nikon Z9. And I just find it a very 
frustration-free shooting experience with a few minor exceptions. It takes nice photos, it takes nice video, it does all of this by default. It does it for a quite reasonable price considering it's a new camera. It is a very good hybrid camera. And finally, if you have any comments or questions about this or the non-X variant of the S5 II, please do put them down in the comments section below. I do read all the comments. I am very curious to know your thoughts. I'll see you next time, but thank you very much for watching.